So, so here, look, I'm going to back us all up again. Yeah. And I continue to do this. I'm going to do it again because both sides are doing it. We are here because a member of the public requested from a government agency documents about that government's operations, mm -hmm. right? And so the, the intention behind that request, the purpose that might be intended to use those documents, um, that none of that, to my way of understanding how the Open Records Act is supposed to work, none of that is relevant. What is relevant is the extent to which the government agency should have those documents and should respond to those documents. And one of the things that's presented an issue, and that's one of the reasons I stopped and went back to this, is that I have no doubt that you are highly knowledgeable about the operations of the district attorney's office, but technically you are here on behalf of non-party witnesses. And I think it would help if when you are talking about the motions to quash, if you talked about the specific witnesses that have been subpoenaed and why they should not be subject to the subpoena. I understand some of those issues are they go across all of them. And let Ms. Monroe and Ms. Bowman argue about why Fulton County and um, the Fulton County District's Attorney's Office writ large and or Madam DA Willis um, do or don't have those documents. And do you understand the distinction that I'm trying to make for a moment? I do, but okay. with one caveat, Your Honor. The, the law for service of subpoenas literally states that subpoenas are not supposed to be used to harass individuals or to, you know, to use those subpoenas maliciously. And I do think that that is a point that needs to be made, especially during this proceeding, considering um, that the usage of subpoenas and the way in which they are used has been done in, in, with an intention to harass to oppress, to um, to malign the, the name, the character, and not just the individuals that are contained, these non-parties, but also the district attorney herself. And so I would be remiss not to note that and that the law does give guidance with regard to how subpoenas are supposed to be used. The individuals fair, are- Fair enough, Ms. Lobby, but here's the thing. I completely understand why the defendants in this case, given the arguments that Ms. Merchant has made, um, that I've, again, tried to get us away from, and let's focus on these are public records, that's all that matters for now. I understand why the DA's office might feel that these proceedings and these efforts at public records requests are designed to harass the DA or the DA's operations. What I don't understand, though, is how is a subpoena to an individual whose job it is to comply with Open Records Act requests on behalf of the DA to come and testify about what efforts he took to comply with an Open Records request. How is that harassing? Judge, the individuals, the non, um, the non parties, Jeff DeSantis, Palabi Bailey, Kevin Armstrong, Jeremy Murray, Jasmine Dillegard, are not those individuals that are tasked with responding to open records. Their job duties, their what they are assigned to do within the office and what they have been doing has never been that. They are not the business records custodians. They cannot talk about in the court, put it very succinctly, the receipt, the processing, the efforts made to process those requests. Those are not the individuals that can provide that information to the court. I agree with you, except that. Again, I think what, what I think I understand is that the reason that the plaintiff chose to subpoena those individuals is because after being told there were no documents by the official people, they received some documents that, for example, emails that included Mr. DeSantis, that included Mr. Armstrong. And so then the plaintiff said, well, if Fulton County, writ large, the DA, whatever, all these entities, right, to whomever that request was directed, says they don't have them, well now I want to ask Mr. Armstrong or Mr. DeSantis, were you asked if you had these documents? Um, the, I, I mean, and again, the reason I'm, I'm trying to narrow this down is because if these witnesses were to take the stand and Miss Merchant were to attempt to engage them or question them about matters that don't have anything to do with the request at issue and their association with that request, then I would agree with you that would start to be harassing. But it's my job to narrow the scope of any witness's testimony to the matters that are properly before the court. And that's why 
think this is the third time I keep coming back to this issue of these are public records, a, a request was made, there was some effort to comply with the request, which the plaintiff has asserted was incomplete and therefore is seeking to enforce. And so, as I understand it, the plaintiff wants to ask these witnesses, what effort did you make to comply? Or were you even asked to provide documents that would be responsive to the requests that I made? And I understand the court's position with regard to that. But we are feeling around in the dark here. We have assertions that have been made that are not facts, that are not evidence. There has been no witness testimony that has been given. There has been no indication that what plaintiff has asserted is true, correct, that, that it's anything other than some assumption that there is some nefarious intention. Well, she has, Ms. Amati, okay. There are two reasons we haven't heard from any witnesses. Number one is there were motions to dismiss filed by all four of the entities who were sued, right? Which automatically created a say of discovery. And number two, no witnesses have testified because no witnesses, the witnesses have all asserted that they're not subject to subpoena or that they don't have any information. So I, I, there might be, at the motion to dismiss stage, the court was required to and did rely only on the allegations of the pleadings. And, and I will say, many of them weren't disputed, right? It wasn't disputed that these were records that would be public. Um, it, it wasn't disputed um, that there's an, a portal operated by Fulton County. I mean, there's lots of things that weren't in dispute, but the court was limited to the pleadings, the allegations and the pleadings. The purpose of today's hearing is to have some actual evidence, um, to hear from witnesses with knowledge about the nature of this request and what efforts were made to comply with it. And those individuals, as discussed in the last hearing, have been designated. We know who those folks are. Dexter Baum Jr. is one of those folks. Shalonda Miller, Deputy um, Counsel, is one of those folks. But those folks still are not Jeff DeSantis, Pallavi Bailey, Kevin Armstrong, Jeremy Murray, or Des Jasmine Dillard. They have never been considered to be those folks in the discussions and the hearings that was had that were had on the fifth. Their names never came up as individuals that would have information that would better inform or edify this court as to the receipt, processing, or efforts made to process any open records requests or responses to the subpoenas. And so because of that, we there has been no dispute in that in the argument that has been presented to the court. Um, and, and because of that, and the other individuals have fulfilled and satisfied the request for the production of documents, because that's what it was, a request for the production of documents, and not a witness subpoena, what we're asking this court to do, at the bare minimum, when counsel comes before, before this honorable court, we are required to do certain things. And properly serving an individual is, is one of those things. Um, that has not, why was, I understand, I agree with you, the email isn't sufficient yet. Um, one day I guess it will be. Um, why though, in this particular context, was certified mail combined with an effort to deliver the subpoena into the hands of a responsible person who would then provide it to. And, and the reason I ask that is, certainly we don't want to live in a universe where the requirement is that individuals personally go and find individual ADAs or individual employees of the DA's office to put a subpoena in their hand when what they're being asked about is their work. And, and instead, accommodate the delivery of a subpoena to a responsible person who will then place it in the hands of the individual who works at the DA's office, given particularly that the DA's office is a limited access location. No one has ever reached out to me in order to serve these subpoenas. I serve as legal counsel for the district attorney. Mm -hmm. What efforts have been made to do that? Certified mail, we have no certified mail. We've not received anything. I literally accepted service on behalf of Curry Swift just the other day, the week before last. We're, there's not an issue with service in our office. We get served all the time. You'd be surprised to know, we get served all the time. <laughs> so there's not an issue with service within our office. I don't understand why plaintiff wishes to be treated differently 
in executing the basic and fundamental duties of any attorney. I shudder to think with this court how this court would view, rule, or decide in a case in which the state brought forth a case and did not properly serve our witnesses. That is our duty, it's our obligation. Council mentioned that we are members of the bar. We sure are. We need to act like it. Serve your witnesses. We, have, we do not have service. We do not have anyone who, to my knowledge, who has come to the office. I've not been contacted by the merchants at all in order to receive service. Our chief investigator has not. That has not happened. What about the, again, and I, what about though, Ms. Um, Merchant's representation? And forgive me, I don't know if it's in the briefing that I read at six o'clock this morning. Uh, or if it's in email traffic that crossed with my staff. Um, but what about, or even today in her argument, but what about her argument that I announced that this hearing was going to take place today? Um, everybody agreed that the hearing would take place today. Um, I clarified that any subpoenas, any witnesses that were under subpoena continued to be under subpoena with the expectation uh, that they would appear here today. And at no time until about six o'clock this morning did those witnesses say, oh, I was never served, oh, I'm not subject to that subpoena, other than the prior representation that had occurred overall where most of these witnesses said, I've already complied with the subpoena because I've said I don't have any documents. Judge, I think one, service, I was not involved in the, the previous um, hearing I thought that that was discussed, but it sounds like it was not, that improper service, because I saw an email stream with the plaintiff and Ms. Monroe talking about whether or not the individuals from our office needed to be reserved. And so... Right, I'm, I'm aware of that, um, but I also know that during that hearing, I said I understand that, that I'm not releasing these witnesses from the subpoenas that brought them here today, um, and that I strongly encourage the parties to engage in good faith efforts to agree. Um, and instead, the, DA, the defendant's counsel took the position that no, you have to serve these individuals, but then would not acknowledge, does not acknowledge I, the, the email notice the certified mail and the delivery to the office of the Fulton County District Attorney's Office, which is, again, a limited access location. I cannot, even as a judge, walk into that office without pushing a buzzer and saying, please let me in, I'm here to see X. And so I suspect that no one had the plaintiffs hired a process server, et cetera, would have been able to walk into the DA's office. I understand your representation is that they could have contacted you and secured service potentially or acceptance of service or whatever on behalf of these individuals. Or they could have come to the front desk. We're open for business 8.30 to 5 every single day, Monday through Friday. We're, it, we are not cordoned off into some you know, secret cauldron of some sort. We Perhaps have a, I misunderstood, but I thought the representation was that that's what they did and they delivered the subpoenas to some front office worker. No. That was not my understanding okay. of that and we do. And, I'm and I apologize if I misunderstood. We, okay. we have not received anyone to our front desk on behalf of this matter that I am aware of. The certified um, mail receipt that was attached to the motion that was filed by plaintiff's counsel, there was an indication that there was a mail room or um, a front desk of some sort. I don't see an address on there. It does not say the district attorney's office. I don't know what, I don't know if it was delivered to the library. We have no way of knowing what efforts were actually undertaken in order to facilitate service other than we don't have good service. We were not served. There was no indication that anybody came physically to the government center and to the district attorney's office in order to effectuate service. Okay, so are, are you arguing that the representation made by the plaintiff that they served by certified mail and attached copies, that those are somehow not accurate or authentic? I don't know what they are. I don't have, I don't have anything that shows, proves, verifies that whatever counsel is representing made it to our office actually made it to our office. I don't have that. Okay. And so, so let me ask you this. Mm -hmm. So let's say that I disagree with your assertion that the testimony that might be sought from these witnesses is overly burdensome or harassing or not relevant. Um, but I 
potentially share your concern about a lack of service, right? Yes, um, given that there's no dispute that these witnesses are aware that they were being requested to appear, right? There's no, I mean, to my knowledge, there's no dispute that these individuals, given your appearance here today, um, also given at least one of the witnesses contacting my office saying, hey, can I please be excused until later in the day, um, well, then why not simply acknowledge service and let's start over again in the morning and actually have the evidentiary hearing that was intended to be had and about which everybody had noticed since September the 5th? I think there's a particular irony in asking that of the state, the non-moving party, when all counsel is not asked to do their jobs, right? We have a duty. We have requirements that we are, we have things that we are required to do as attorneys. And one of those fundamental things are making sure that we have the people there under the proper mechanisms that are outlined in the law in order to be there. There's no requirement on behalf of myself as, as legal counsel, uh, Mr. Attorney Willis, to waive anything. We do not, that's not a requirement of us. Um, and quite frankly, with all of the vitriol and negative assertions and just the gamesmanship that has been taking place in this case, why would we? We have complied because, with the as subpoenas. you said a moment ago, almost everybody involved in this case is an attorney who has a professionalism and civility obligation to each other, to the profession, to the court. Uh, and again, I fully appreciate and understand that there's lots of gamesmanship. And I don't mean to apply because I know that I don't mean to imply that I don't see some of the gamesmanship coming from the plaintiff's side. I understand your concerns. But again, that's why I keep trying to pull us back to, this is a public records request that was served in January, right? Or maybe even before then, maybe we just got to the point of where's the answer in January. Maybe it was even before then. I don't remember exactly as I sit here. But it's September of 2024, and the plaintiff is taking the position that they still don't have documents they've requested that the DA's office, whatever we're calling that entity, would have an obligation to have, to produce, and that are public records and, and there seems to be a lot of delay here, a lot of effort to keep pushing backwards instead of making an effort to simply get to the substantive issue, which is, do these documents exist? And if so, why were they not produced? Or do these documents not produce, not exist, which is why they were not produced, and therefore why the plaintiff has no claim, no further issue to pursue. And that's what is frustrating the court, and, and that's, what, that's what I think y'all both sides should hear at this point, is that this is supposed to be fairly straightforward, and the gamesmanship about which you complain, I'm concerned, is also being is it being engaged in by both sides. Because it's not that hard for these witnesses to come and say, I got the request, this is what I did, I gave them what we had. Here's what efforts I did when they said this isn't what this isn't enough, or I think you have more. These are the additional efforts I made to locate them. Those are legitimate inquiries. And the idea when there's no dispute that the DA's office has, and I, I'm, when there's no dispute that the defendants and the non-party witnesses who are associated with one or other of the defendant entities have notice of the subpoenas, um, both from this court stating we were going to have a hearing where I expected witnesses to be called who had previously been identified, um, to a certified mailing notice to a courtesy email, and then my question is, well then, okay, if, why not just acknowledge service or have the, let's adjourn the hearing, have the merchants walk across the street, give it to the front, give all the subpoenas to the front door window of the DA's office, and is that gonna be sufficient? That, that what I'm trying to figure out is, at what point do we get to the merits of this? Because one day we might get to the merits and I might say, you know what? I think the DA did everything they were supposed to do and tried to find all the documents and they just don't have them and that's okay and they didn't do anything wrong. But, but we'll never get there because 
everybody keeps throwing up roadblocks to have a conversation about the actual merits of where are these documents and what efforts were made to locate them. I understand the court's position. Um, I do. I will say that what the court views as roadblocks are our assertions of the law. We look to the law and we look to see what you know what remedies are available to us under the law and we follow the law. And that's what we have done in filing these motions to quash. That's what we have done with regard to responding to an improperly served subpoena in order to not engage in gamesmanship, in order to give a member of the public what they have asked for. Um, we have communicated with plaintiff's counsel. We have asked for clarification on a number of issues. We have received, yet again, subpoena after subpoena, with different requesting different information. Um, and we have asserted our legal standings, our legal rights, and we have followed the law and what we are to do when we are presented with these issues. And I don't fault you for asserting those issues at all. I mean, that's your job and you're right, right? Like, you're, you're entitled to say we were not properly served. If I agree with you that service did not properly occur, then that's where, you know, we'll, we'll deal with that. But respectfully, you didn't actually answer my question, which was when I said, well, why not just accept service now and let's get to the merits tomorrow? Um, instead of saying, okay, or no because you just said well i think it's rich for them to you know ask the court to go forward and force y'all to do something without observing the legal niceties um when they haven't observed the legal niceties and so i i think i respectfully disagree with your assertion or recharacterization of what was said i my position is we are here and we have been requested to produce certain things. All we're asking is that we have an evil, even field, even requirements, that everybody who walks into this courtroom is treated the same. That we, when we come in, that we are prepared to proceed with our case. When counsel comes in, they're prepared to proceed with their case. And if we are not properly served, if the law is not followed with regard to whatever it is that is asked of us, the law is not followed. If we drop the ball, then there is that next step. Whatever it is that flows from that, we own that if we mess up. Right, but, but again, so that again begs the question, what happens if I adjourn this hearing today, say we're going to start again tomorrow, and the plaintiffs take their, their subpoenas mm -hmm. and come over to the DA's office and physically hand them to the front office? Then we're served. And then we can all have this substantive hearing tomorrow where I have a completely free open day. The, Your Honor, like I told you it, earlier, we get served all the time. This is not something that is unique to our office, unique to my role and my position within the office. We literally get served all the time. And so for us, for that not to happen, not just once, but twice in the same proceeding, at what point do we say, hey, we all have a, a job, a duty, responsibilities. Well, we should. Uh, forgive me for interrupting. I'm sorry. Technically, even if those subpoenas from August 2nd and previously were not served properly, um, that objection was waived by the fact that the individuals responded to them, right? I mean, they, they filed some sort of answer saying they acknowledged service, whether they formally acknowledged service or not. But most of those witnesses did respond to the subpoena by saying, here's a custodian of documents saying I don't have any documents. Um, so I think we're focusing our efforts on the subpoenas that were served in advance of this hearing, correct? Yes. Okay. But I bring up the August 2nd because it, it, it appears that the same methodology or tactics were used even though that was that issue on the August 2nd. And so instead of there being the extra step to reach out to myself or to reach out to someone else within the office to say, hey, we're trying to make sure that this gets to you guys so that you, one, have it, that you know what the scope is, that we can have those discussions as the court has. Which presumably they did by emailing it to you, but. And let's talk about this email that we received on Friday, um, at the end of the day on Friday, to, to produce voluminous, I imagine, because we haven't even had a chance to, to take a look at these things, produce voluminous documents mid-hearing. We're literally on a pause from a hearing that started on um, September 5th, and the game changes on us. We get served with, we get emails because it's not even proper service, 
new subpoena, new information is requested, it is voluminous, and then there is that added an additional request that we have multiple members of this office come in to testify to something that we have already certified, to something that we have already provided, and we're not even given a sufficient opportunity to respond really to anything other than what we have provided by way of the business record certification. I'm not sure I, what do you mean you weren't given an opportunity to respond to anything? That's what I'm not, I mean, aren't you doing that now? No, I'm talking about with regard to what's, re what's been requested in the September 13th um, email, subpoena. So Ms. Merchant during her presentation did not go into detail about the nature of the documents being requested in the subpoenas or you know the areas that the witnesses were being requested to testify about mm -hmm. what she did the way she framed it is that the still open public records requests that they made related to critical mention documents a list of attorneys forfeiture disclosure reports and promotional materials or rebranding materials mm -hmm. that those are all open and to her mind i understand this the, the defendants disagree with that um, open records requests that have not been responded to or fully responded to. And so, to the, I think, to the extent that the subpoenas contain be prepared to testify about X or produce documents regarding X, the idea is that it would be in service of those four items, not that it is a new public record request, I think, and maybe I'll hear from the plaintiff differently, okay. because yeah. what I hear you, what I hear you saying, and that's what I'm trying to understand is, are you arguing that this is a new public record request? Because I, I'm not sure. I mean, formal Open Records Act public request. I'm arguing that this is a new subpoena. It is. This is a new subpoena. It has a new date. It has new information. It's requesting new and different information from the individuals that are named here. And right, so that was people serve subpoenas in advance of hearings all the time with relatively short notice and say, "Be prepared to, you know, testify about these things." Because these issues aren't new, right? The subpoena is, but the issues aren't new. But, I mean, but the request to produce these documents um, with 72 hours notice for all payments, requests, uh, vendor applications, invoices, receipts, promotional um, material, brochures, flyers, mailers, that's just one enumeration, right? To, to compile, to research, to compile this information takes longer than that. We There's a, a research period if this had been served properly, though it is not. Um, but this is the overburdensome type of subpoenas that we continue to receive. Um, and then to ask that these individuals take time out of their day away from serving the constituents of Fulton County, our victims, our, our individuals who have been affected by crime in order to come in here and testify with regard to this, Your Honor, I, that is what makes this request, this, this subpoena of a sort that should be quashed as a matter of law, not just for the lack of service, um, but there is a there are individuals, like I said previously, who are who have already been designated as the individuals who keep the records for the Fulton County District Attorney's Office, for our county, who know how these are, how these requests are received, processed, and the efforts made, um, as the court has stated. Um, even plaintiff's counsel herself indicated that Dexter Bond, uh, Shalonda Miller, those individuals. She also included Jeff DeSantis. We disagree with that. But those are the individuals that will have the information that is relevant to the issue before this court. Um, this is not, this should not be a fishing expedition where as much information as possible is trying to be obtained in order to help in the um, adjacent criminal case. That's not what this should be. I agree. And as I have said multiple times, this case is, despite the subtext that all of y'all seem to be aware of and seem to keep deferring to, which I understand why it frustrates both sides. This is a public records act, an open records act action. It's an action to enforce a request for open records. And that's all it is. Now, what somebody might try to do with those records and why they're being asked for, that's, that is not my concern. And I'm trying real hard to keep it out of this proceeding because it does not, it does not control the outcome and it should not concern the court. Now, I also fully intend 
whenever a witness actually takes the stand, to keep the, the nature of any inquiry very narrow to the issue here and not let the plaintiffs engage in some sort of fishing expedition that doesn't have to do with the public records request that they asked for and that they are seeking to enforce. And, and so, What I'm trying to, we've been, let's see, this hearing started at 9, well, I guess we started late because we had to get a court report. So it's, it started at 10 o'clock. We've been going roughly two hours, and we still haven't gotten to the, the, where we need to be, which is the subpoenas. I, I, I except to the extent that it's my intention to limit the scope of any inquiry of any of these witnesses to the very narrow issues that are presented. Uh, I disagree with you that these subpoenas are overly broad or unduly burdensome, given that everybody had an understanding of what was going to be at issue um, for some time. Now, I think your best argument is probably that they weren't properly served but that is something that can be remedied through either one, the parties civilly and professionally agreeing to accept service, which I can't compel anyone to do, or by securing service today um, in advance of the substantive hearing that this case should have already had by now. Um, and, and so what I'm wondering, um, Ms. Alavi, is does that, if, if I tell you that I disagree with your position that the subpoenas are overly broad, but that I might agree with you about service issues, but that that service issue can be resolved, then does that resolve your issue, understanding that you continue to disagree with that ruling? Um, but it would ultimately be a ruling denying your motion to quash on the basis that it was overly broad, but perhaps granting your motion to quash on the basis that it wasn't properly, specifically served in the exact manner on the individual required by law. What are your thoughts? I still think, and based on my motion, that the individuals listed for the non-parties, minus Mr. Bond Jr., they have no relevant information with regard to the issues that are before the court. Um, they are not the custodian of records. They are not the individuals that are tasked with um, determining how those records are received, what we do with them, how we process them, the efforts that we made for diligent searches. They are not those individuals. They just happen to be individuals that may have sent an email um, or received an email. They are not the individuals that can speak to how open records are handled within the office. So there right. is... And and I think I understood both Ms. Merchant's statement here this morning and also cross email um, that I saw. Mm -hmm. uh, that Ms. Merchant, I think at the beginning of this hearing, identified three witnesses that she intended to call. Mm -hmm. um, one of whom is Mr. Bond, right, whose, whose job it is to deal with open records. Understood. Mm -hmm. um, and that I think the discussion in the email communications that the parties copied the court on was that the only reason that they might need to get into the weeds of these other witnesses is if those three witnesses say we never, that document doesn't exist when they have documentary evidence that an email was sent to somebody. Um, and so part of the issue is, as I said earlier today, regarding the motion to quash the subpoena to Madam D.A. Willis, the motion for contempt, I should say, is premature because nobody's actually tried to call Von Willis to testify in this case, mm -hmm. uh, in this proceeding. Um, and I wonder if the same is true about those extraneous witnesses um, because it may be that their testimony would be cumulative or immaterial to the proceedings depending on how the testimony of those three witnesses that were initially identified by Ms. Merchant and please forgive me, I know Mr. Bond is one of them, I don't remember the two, maybe Mr. DeSantis and yeah. one other person. Yeah, Ms. Miller. Mm -hmm. Ms. Miller, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, so, if we were to proceed with 
at some point uh, with Mr. Bond, Mr. DeSantis, and Ms. Miller. Um, does that also address part of your concerns, Ms. Lobby, on behalf of your clients? Um, other than what I know you're going to perfect for your record, right? That those individuals have already signed documents saying we don't have anything else responsive. Um, but does that satisfy at least part of your concerns about the nature of what's sought from them for this proceeding? The nature of what's sought from them? In the nature and scope of the testimony and documents they've been asked to provide. I would still object to Mr. DeSantis being called as a witness um, for the same argument that I've made a couple of times now. He is just, he, he does not have any relevant information concerning anything that has been before your honor. Um, Mr. Bond Jr., quite frankly, is the one who has the information. He's the one who has the knowledge of how open records work within the office. Um, he is the best witness. He is, quite frankly, the only witness that can really testify to the mechanisms that we have in place within the office in order to ensure that individuals that reach out to us and wish to receive open records receive them. And so I would still um, ask this court and move this court to, to quash the subpoena with regard to Mr. DeSantis. Um, Mr. Bond testifying, I, I understand that, Your Honor, which is why I separated him from the pack at the onset of this um, argument, because he is differently situated and he does have information that would be helpful um, to Your Honor. Um, but the other individuals that I have filed these motions on behalf of, just they just don't. That's not part of their duties, it's not part of their job, it's not something that they've handled. Um, they don't have that information. And so uh, because of that and based on that and all the arguments um, before now, we would ask this honorable court to quash um, these subpoenas. Call Mr. Bond if, if counsel wishes to do that and um, get that testimony, but the other individuals are not the, the proper parties. Okay, but to be clear, only after he's properly served with a subpoena, correct? He would testify. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Ms. Alani. Ms. this request becomes relevant, but it, we have, we're nowhere near that point yet. 
Right. And, 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 and so that's where the harassing part comes in. I do believe that these subpoenas were issued not for the information, not, for, not to seek information as it pertains to the underlying request, because the underlying open records requests were submitted to the Fulton County District Attorney's Office, not to the DA in her official capacity. The people who can speak to those things, to well, the process. In fairness, let's be precise, the requests were made through the portal that is maintained by Fulton County to the Fulton County District Attorney's Office. And the only reason it became an issue that Bonnie Willis as the District Attorney of Fulton County did not receive those requests is because the drop down menu on the portal says Fulton County District Attorney's Office and then Fulton County District Attorney's Office said we can't be sued to enforce this request because we're not an entity. So that's how we got here. I, I, don't, I don't think you gain anything by arguing, well, the district attorney was never served with this request because the request was made in the manner that requests are supposed to be made in that the portal was used to submit it to an appropriate entity that would have, rep, that would have custody of these records. So I don't think that helps you, so maybe move on to a different position. And, and, I, and, and just to clarify, the point, the reason why I brought that up, and, and testimony from Deputy Sean Shalana Miller and Desta Vaughn can actually clear up that process and how it actually works mm -hmm. as it pertains to Fulton County and the District Attorney's Office adjacent, with adjacent and by way of use of the portal. Um, but as it pertains to um, DA Willis and the process of open records from receipt of the request, how it's handled down to the request itself and how it's provided, she wouldn't have any particularized or special superior knowledge as to that. And so in the interest of judicial economy, we want to make sure that we have witnesses that would be competent to speak to those things, who would have personal knowledge that would speak to those things. And to have DA Fonnie Willis here to speak to those things would not be that. Okay. Um, so, but here's the thing. One, DA Willis is not here. Correct. Right? Two, if, if I am presiding over a trial, right, the lawyers will typically subpoena eight, nine, ten witnesses, right, if they think they can get through that many in a day. Mm -hmm. And I would never, ever hold a witness in contempt for failing to appear if nobody actually called them to the stand and then they weren't there in compliance with the subpoena. Um, so that's number one, which is why the motion to hold Madam D.A. Willis in contempt, in my opinion, is premature. Mm -hmm. By extension, I think the motion to quash at this point is moot because nobody's actually called her to the stand. I've already said my belief based on the case law is that the plaintiffs are going to have to make some sort of showing as to why her testimony would be specifically relevant here. That doesn't necessarily relieve her from the obligation to potentially to, to potentially be subject to the subpoena, to be under subpoena. Um, and I don't know that I can make an informed decision about the nature of any individual information that Ms. Willis may have um, unless and until I hear from witnesses and the plaintiffs make some showing that the only way we'll ever answer this question is to hear from Madam D.A. Willis, which, as you can probably tell from my tone, is a pretty high bar. Um, so, so I, I mean, I don't know if it's that, I mean, to my way of thinking, the motion to quash is not something that I'm going to entertain right now. I'm not going to relieve Madam D.A. Willis um, of the possibility of having to testify. Um, in terms of being under subpoena for this proceeding. Um, but from an evidentiary and court management perspective, the court certainly reserves the right to say, no, I'm not letting you call that witness. That testimony would be cumulative. It would be immaterial. There's any number of reasons that I might never need to hear from Madam D.A. Willis on this particular issue. And so to me, all of those matters, as I started with this morning, I, I think are premature at this point. Um, and so I will, I will la I'm happy to let you continue to make your legal argument for your record about why Madam DA should not be subject to the subpoena and that the subpoena should be quashed. But 
ultimately, I don't expect I'm going to give you a ruling on that unless and until the rubber hits the road and somebody actually tries to call her to testify here. Okay. So we reached out to opposing counsel to inform them that she was not going to be present at this hearing. Um, we, and they, they alluded to the fact of who would be testifying, but in terms of making DA Bonnie Willis subject to a subpoena that she hasn't been served with, that is well, the second that's, part. That's a different that's issue, a right? sec yeah. That's the second part of our, our, of our motion. So but she, when, when the- One question, yes. so help me understand factually. Um, is the subpoena that was delivered, we're gonna try and use a different word than served, because I understand that's a disputed issue right now. Is the subpoena that was delivered uh, for Madam DA, right? Um, it, does it fall into the same category that it was sent by certified mail um, and an email was sent, but it was not delivered to the front office or in any personal way? So the same exact process, is that right? Yeah, so we have ongoingly uh, check with the DA's office to see if service was received by uh, Madam or the office, front desk as they alleged, um, in their pleadings, and that has not been the case. When I did a checking of the, U the USPS uh, tracking that they provided in their exhibits, I think it's exhibit G, in their certified return receipt mail receipt, there it just says Bonnie Willis, doesn't provide an address, and then when I look at the tracking, it says could be at front desk, mail room, it has all these slashes of all the places that this certified mailing could be. Well, but if certified mail is allowed, right? If certified mail is an acceptable way to serve a subpoena, and it was mailed to the address, right, that someone, I, I think I understood Ms. Merchant to say that it was return receipt requested. Um, so someone signed the return receipt? That is not my representation, okay. um, that if someone signed the receipt. All I know is that in tracking the certified return receipt that the plaintiff alleged was sent, that it was confirmed that it could be delivered at the front desk, mail, which is all different places uh, within Fulton County government. The front oh. desk and the mail room. Being someone are, who's subject to getting my mail through okay, Fulton County all different processes. Places. But, but I guess my question is, is there really a dispute that the subpoena was mailed to an address at which one could expect Eventually, yeah, the it's, DA it's still receive. something that she has to receive, and she was not in the jurisdiction it, to receive it. Well, okay. If it was properly mailed to an address that's associated with the DA, where the DA expects to receive mail, if certified mail is sufficient, isn't that sufficient? It's my understanding that it's not just the certified mailing. Once you've done the certified mailing, the person that it's certified mail to would have to accept that certified mailing. You can't just leave it at a front desk of someone's home, leave it at the front desk of someone's office. That person would have to have received personally that certified mailing. I would not be able to accept certified mailing on anybody from my office. I'm, that's just not how it works. I'm not, I think we need to talk about that a little more. I'm not sure that that is accurate. I, I, I think that if personal service is required, then personal service is required. If service by mail is allowed, then delivering it to the address where that person or entity is known to receive mail potentially would be complete service. Um, because otherwise, then really you're just engaging in an extended effort at personal service if the argument is once it gets certified mail delivered to, again, to my analogy of the CEO, the mail room of the Ford Corporation, right? and the Ford Motor Company, and then it's got to go through 17 hands before it actually gets placed in the hands of the secretary of the CEO, that would defeat the purpose of allowing certified mail of a subpoena, would it not? Well, the, the thing about a subpoena that it, it subjects the actual person to do something, the actual person. So absent some sort of express consent from that person who is, who, who, who is named in that subpoena, Subpoena is not, that, that service of that subpoena is not enforceable. The court does provide some direction on this. In the Edenfield versus State case, um, it says that the lack of personal service 
invalidates the legal force and effect of a subpoena. So whether it be hand delivery or certified mail or overnight mailing, that person in which who is the receipt of those mail is the person who must receive that mailing absent unless it gives a third party consent to do so in order for it to be enforceable. Okay. That is my understanding of the interpretation interpretation of, of, of the statute and so by so by that logic, let's lay it out to its natural conclusion. The the DA was not in the state of Georgia on Friday when I think I think someone has told me that Friday of uh, which was Friday the 13th, how fitting. Um, that Friday the 13th was when this mat, the, these uh, subpoenas were mailed to, or delivered in the mail to the district attorney's office, right? Is, is that correct? That's correct. Okay. And so by your logic, because Madam DA Willis was out of town on Friday, that subpoena could never be served on her because she wasn't here to receive service of a certified mail mailing to her office where she routinely receives mail. Well, that's assuming that it was sent to her office. But, and that's correct. If she was not there to receive it in person and she did not provide express consent for it to be received on her behalf, that is not proper service. Okay. And also, too, I, I failed to mention in the in the first part of my argument, in terms of the harass the the substance of the subpoena. Um, if the court can recall, there were two subpoenas served, um, well, actually three three subpoenas that were issued by the plaintiffs. Uh, in that, the first one was for the production, a slew of production of electronic communication regarding critical mention. Then. We have an alleged witness, a witness subpoena, which never took place. There was no witness subpoena. There was only a subpoena for the production of documents, and that was something that I raised at our last hearing. Right. And we had some discussions about whether or not we were going to incur additional costs as to um, effectuate service on those subpoenas. And I did raise the challenge that what plaintiff was alleging to be a witness subpoena was not in fact a witness subpoena. It was a a, a subpoena for the, the production of documents. Now, with a witness subpoena, you're supposed to provide a scope of testimony. In, in, in either cases where, in any not, of the no, subpoenas. Not necessarily. So a 30B6 deposition notice or subpoena, you have to require, uh, you have to provide a, a sort of a list of areas of inquiry so that the entity can make sure that it's got one or more people um, sufficiently prepared to testify on behalf of the entity. But here, the scope of the questions are limited by what's relevant in the, in the context of the case. Um, now, I understand it might have been accompanied by subpoena requests for documents, but the scope of the testimony that might be offered or expected to be offered by any individual under subpoena is you know, controlled by the scope of the, of the case. Okay, so to that, to that point, which leads me to my next point, you have subpoenas for the request of documents that are not the same as the underlying open records requests. They do not mirror each other at all. Yes, they are key, they are key terms such as critical mention, forfeiture reports, analytical reports, but they're not the same exact requests or um, searchable items. So we're essentially what plaintiff has done here is opened up a whole new comportment of information that she, originally she wasn't entitled to. And so now we have a slew of subpoenas to what started out as from 16 individuals to now 11. That's harassing. That is harassing within itself. When you know that there are designated individuals, Can officials. Can you clarify that for me? Because yes. Ms. Merchant represented when she first started arguing that there really still are only six people and yet I've heard the number 12, I've heard the number 11, I don't know, but I would love to know the answer of are there six or are there 11? Okay, so from what I can recall, and I believe this is all part of the court's record, mm -hmm. but there was a notice of filing of subpoenas, yes. and I do believe that there were a list of somewhere around 
16. Don't, don't yes, quote me. I would have to just double that check is that. part of the record. It is for my benefit. I'm going to say this. Uh, there was a notice of filing subpoenas filed on August the 30th. It's docket number 48 in my mm -hmm. record. So okay. yes, and there were a number of individuals, all of whom I don't know if it was that they were provided to plaintiffs and they filed them, or if defendants filed them. But it looks like Bond, Willis, DeSantis, Bailey, Dilligard, Armstrong, Kerrigan, Murray. Uh, that is the list. But they all filed some sort of response and objection to the subpoenas that were served on them. Yes, sir, and I was the one who filed those objections. Thank on you. Their okay. Um, and also those responses, mm -hmm. um, hoping that it would resolve it. However, it became a moving target where, oh no, we're not talking about critical mention documents anymore. We're talking about all these other things, rebranding, promotional materials, list of attorney, list of attorneys in there, in their hiring dates. If you compare, and this, if we, once we get to the hearing, Your Honor, we'll be able to view the open record request individually, precisely, as to what was requested and how they were responded to. And also, we can also compare the, uh, compare them to the actual uh, subpoenas for a production of documents to see what was requested of these individuals, um, why, they were, why these individuals were even selected to request these things. I mean, I have, a subpoena from Miss English, and she's someone I didn't even file a motion to quash for because I, at, at this point, it was just completely out of hand. But I said, you know what, her test, her testimony or getting her here, um, I do believe is rele irrelevant as it pertains to the subpoena, all because she missed one email uh, to have her be subject to a subpoena is, I've never heard of that type of practice before. But this is how the plaintiffs have decided to practice in this matter by calling all these, subjecting all these people to subpoenas who they know that do not have access to that information. Ms. English, who is a member of External Affairs, she has no, she does not work for the DA's office. She has, uh, she wouldn't have any information regarding the DA's bank accounts. I have a, I have a, uh, I have a subpoena in front of me here where she's asking for checking accounts from critical mentioning contracts. And DAs from the DA's office. Why would Miss English have that information? A member from External Affairs. Well, this is why I, I say it's harassing. She's asking I members. I don't know the answer, but I think my review of the initial requests were that these individuals are people who would have handled or been involved in branding and media relations, such that they might have knowledge of documents that existed that have not been produced by the DA's office. Even though, again, I agree with you, probably not their job to be in charge of those documents. But if they know that they exist because they had them at some point because they were sent to them, um, or maybe if it's external affairs, if it's your job to send that out into the world, right? But now, but what about for yeah. said, I'm sorry. But what about forfeiting documents? What about um, attorneys, uh, attorneys hiring dates in, in, for hiring? Like, why would someone from external affairs have that information? So, I, I, I don't disagree with you, but, but that's not a reason to say that they're not subject to subpoena. No, that's I'm a, saying that for, because they're not, I'm sorry. That's a reason to say the scope of what they're asking this witness is excessive. I want you to say they can only ask them X, Y, and Z. And what I've said, I think a couple of times relative to various witnesses and certainly Madam DA Willis is that kind of have to trust me that I know what's relevant in this case and that I'm not going to let people go on a fishing expedition. That I'm just going to say, ask them about the open records. And if that witness, if they get asked a question about bank records and you stand up and object and say, this witness works for external affairs, she would have no knowledge, and I'm going to go, that I'm going to sustain your objection. I mean, so much of this is subjective about how this evidence is going to come in and about what is relevant to the scope of this hearing, this proceeding, which is, are the records public records? Were they maintained? Were they requested? What efforts were made to provide that? I completely understand the court's position. And I guess because we're so closely tied to this case, we know the ins and outs of it, and we know that if you are, if you're, sole purpose is to obtain information, there's a comportment, there's a posture in which you do so. And the plaintiff has not taken that posture. In fact, they're using this as a, as a, as a platform 
to, to, to create a show. Um, this is not about gaining information. This is purely about harassment. And I'm not shy to express that to the court. And I understand how the court may differ on this point. It's not, no, it's not that I differ. It's that all of you are talking about the fishing expeditions and the harassment that I can, and the gamesmanship that I can see on both sides. But what I am telling you is the law does not support that as a basis, right? The, the questions that a court is to consider on an open records enforcement action is, are the records public? Were they requested? Were they produced? And if they were not produced, why were they not produced? They, it, why the person wants them is not a relevant consideration, even if I think that the only reason the person wants them is for harassing reasons. That's not a relevant consideration. And so I understand your frustration, but again, I, I think we are wasting each other's time by continuing to talk about the gamesmanship and the harassing nature of this exercise because I kind of agree with all of you that this is both frustrating and gamesmanship on all sides and probably gonna be used for some harassment or whatever on the back end. But my concern legally within the structure of an Open Records Act request is, are the records public? Which doesn't seem to be in dispute. These are public records that would be subject to the Open Records Act. Were they requested? Also doesn't seem to be in dispute. And were they produced? That is in dispute. And if they were not produced, why were they not produced? Also in dispute. And now, if we narrow ourselves to those issues, then it just feels like we can move this case forward to actually consider the substance rather than this, which seems to be, they're trying to harass me, so I'm not going to agree with anything they ask me, and vice versa. Um, they're not agreeing, they're putting up roadblocks, so I'm not gonna agree to anything, right? And, and that is not, that is not the way that we all want to conduct ourselves. I understand, Your Honor. Um, and just to close, um, in terms of, you know, Your Honor, we're not trying to belabor this point any further. Uh, we do understand that we have a hearing to get to, and we have individuals here who can testify to the merits of this case in a way that is efficient, in a way that is substantive, and in a way that can bring this case to a speedy close. Um, without all the extras. Um, and those are two individuals are Dexter Bond and Shalana Miller. We stipulate to the point that uh, to the, that documents weren't provided initially, and the, as what the hearing will display, it will get into the request, it will get into who received the request, it will, it will get into how the request was processed and how the request was responded to. But I would just ask the court, in the interest of judicial economy and to make sure that we are actually getting the information that will be helpful to the court to consider so the court can have an easier job in hearing the case on its actual merits versus the narrative that the plaintiff wants to produce the court. Okay, so thank you, Ms. Monroe. A couple of questions I have for you before you have a seat and then we will move on. Um, essentially, same question to, and, and it may be to Ms. Alavi, I'm not sure, but it, I think I understood that for the limited purpose of moving us forward, that Mr. Bond would be willing to waive that insistence on formal service and be available to testify today. Did I understand that correctly? Yes, Your Honor. I would ask this court to reserve ruling on my motions until such time that Mr. Bond does testify and okay. see if that settles your mind with regard to the other individuals, not party. Um, and, and that was my intention. My next question is, what about Ms. Miller? <clears throat> Yes, Your Honor. She's, She's willing ready. to. Absolutely. We didn't file a motion to quash on her behalf. Okay. Just want to make sure. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Merchant. Yes, Your 